Hello, welcome. We're so excited to have you here with us today for our July, kind of August book club um, featuring John Casey and photographer of the beautiful book, the Meridian, um, Scott. Scott Hussey. Um, we're so excited to have you here with us today. Um, we really appreciate all of your support and participation, and we hope you enjoy the program. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. Um, first of all, uh, thank you, Philo Coffee, for having us today, uh, hosting us a cozy little spot to do this. Uh, it's, a, it's the perfect setting for uh, a book club event. And uh, thank you very much, Samantha Scori and the World First Council of San Antonio for uh, hosting the event and for setting up all of the uh, uh, technology and, and getting this out there on, on Zoom for the virtual event. Um, so this is a hybrid, and uh, uh, for those of you that are joining uh, uh, virtually, um, you, you can't get a signed copy after the event, but you could uh, email me afterwards or uh, go to my website, johnjkc.com, and contact me from there, and I will, will be happy to send it to you. So I'm John Casey. I'm the author. Uh, we're here to talk to you today about Meridian, a raw fox book. I'm joined on the big screen to my left by the photographer, Scott Hussey, uh, not only the photographer for uh, Meridian, but also for our first book, uh, Raw Thoughts. And uh, so Meridian is a sequel. Uh, raw Thoughts was nominated for the National Book Award and the Griffin Poetry Prize, um, part of the uh, catalyst. Uh, for us to decide to do a second book. Um, so what we're going to do today is just going to be a little bit of back and forth between Scott and me, and uh, we're going to do a little bit of reading. Um, Scott is going to share some photography with the audience, and we're going to have some stories and a little bit of the behind-the-scenes footage from, uh, from the photo shoots in Putney, Vermont. Um, and if there are any questions, please speak up. Um, and with that, let's get started. So, Scott, um, we when we first started uh, with this idea of putting together raw thoughts, um, the idea was that uh, we would um, have poetry that was paired with uh, photos, uh, and that that pairing would be called a raw thought. And the book would move from a very dark place at the beginning all the way to a place of light at the end. It, it was very emotive poetry, and thus the photos were as well. Um, and we reached out and, and we, we found, after a long search, uh, uh, two models, a male and a female, uh, Anna Apostolova from the Ukraine. Um, for those of you that are wondering what the international tie-in is, this is hosted by the World First Council of San Antonio. There's one there, right? Um, and uh, so Anna's from Ukraine, her mom um, is a noted poet uh, there in Ukraine. And you can see her to my right in this photo. Roman Katok to my left, he's from Belarus. And we found him in Philadelphia of all places. We, we looked far and wide for the, the right uh, models to uh, shoot the photos with. Uh, and so this photo right here is the team meeting again in Putney, Vermont for a week long shoot uh, to do all the shots for Meridian. Uh, and so uh, with that, Scott, do you want to talk at all like, um, about the photography in general before we jump into talking about the, the, uh, the photos and the, and the poetry? Certainly, certainly. Yeah. The uh, when John first approached me, um, I, I want to say seven years ago about the the idea for the first book, um, I was I was pretty interested in it. The first book we shot all on film, and uh, it was an interesting challenge. And this the book Meridian was shot primarily on digital. There are a few film photos in there, but it was mostly done on digital. And we felt it was important that we had that we used the same models for all of the photos. So we could almost be looking inside these people's lives. And 
So finding the right models and dependable models were, was, uh, was a bit of a challenge. We were hoping to find people locally. Uh, we, we lucked out finding Anna in the Boston area, but finding a male model proved to be a huge challenge. And we were very lucky uh, and fortunate that Roman uh, Katok was, was willing to do it on the first book. And when we approached them both uh, regarding the second book, they were both very eager to do it. Um, so so we, we, we lucked out in, in finding the right personalities, not just, you know, we weren't going for a specific look necessarily. We really wanted people who believed in the project as much as we did. Um, and the, the fifth person in that photo that you're seeing on the screen there is Victoria McIntosh. And she did most of the hair and makeup for both books. Um, and she was happy to come back on the, uh, uh, to come back and help out with the second book. Uh, Victoria and I work together a lot on theatrical projects with her being a, a theatrical makeup artist and me being a photographer. Um, we work together a lot. So this was kind of fun for us to do something a little bit different than what we we're, were used to doing. Um, when it came to do Meridian, I think John and I had talked about the photo concepts for about a year and we were all set to do it last April. Um, and then COVID happened. And so we had another year to think about it. <laughs> and uh, we finally were able to get it done this April. And we shot all of the photos in the book over, I think, a five day period. Is that right, John? Five days. Yep. Yeah. Five days. Yeah. Which was, which was, it, it was an aggressive schedule, but having the extra year to think about it, uh, I think, helped us uh, really fine tune the thought process and really get everything. Um, figured out well enough. Um, figured out. Sorry, we lost you for a second. Okay, well, take it away, John. All right. Um, so for those of you that are wondering what the difference between Rothox and Meridian uh, is, and it is important um, that there is a distinction between the two books. Otherwise, it would just be kind of a, a copy of the same thing. Um, Raw Thoughts really is very much an, an emotive book. It's very evocative. It is um, it, it is designed specifically to evoke emotion in the reader as they read through the book and to try to identify with those feelings and decide if those feelings are correct. And if they're not, then perhaps to change how the reader thinks uh, and to improve on their thinking so that they can then uh, hopefully begin to lead a, letter, a better life. I took that one step further with the underlying philosophy in Meridian. Um, what, and while it's still emotive, it is certainly much more cognitive. So there is, there is, it's much more cerebral. The poetry is less about emotions and more about actual thought uh, and, and philosophy and right and wrong and these types of questions that, you know, and ethics and things like that. Um, and, and the idea is that, you know, if you've already done what raw thoughts is supposed to get you to do, you can, you're then in a better position to try to understand other people better uh, and then find out where you fit in in, in the community where, of, of humans, where, where, how you fit best into, the, into your environment. Uh, and if you want to boil that to, down to one word, it's about empathy. Um, so understanding other people now that you understand yourself. And I think we did a pretty good job with that. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, read the first poem for you, and, uh, and then we're gonna share the photo as well. Uh, and this one is called Oblivion. And this comes from the beginning of the book. And remember when I said, the beginning of the book is pretty dark. Uh, and then by degrees, it gets lighter until the end is uh, the complete opposite from the beginning. Oblivion. It comes on when I am alone, in the dark, usually halfway between sleep and waking. It is fleeting, but I can sometimes get it back for a mindful, masochistic moment if I focus. 
is not a vision, a sound, or smell, or texture. Instead, some wretched, untenable amalgam that cannot, should not, must be. I need it desperately to go away. Terrible and foreboding it welcomes me. To revel in its sublime, rotted, chaotic perfection. To dance to the arrhythmic cadence of its deafening silence. To plummet headlong into its sky and embrace the intangible. And I think Scott's going to tell us a little bit about the how we uh, how we came up with this photo. Yeah, the uh, the original photo concept that that John presented, and, and the way that we've worked through this, um, a lot of times John will when he has when he sends me the poems, he'll have a photo idea just to to kind of get me started. And sometimes he has nothing, and I I start from scratch. But this one, he he had a photograph uh, that they had seen that. It, the, the top of the person's head was just sort of evaporating into a million little broken shards. And it was all done, you know, in Photoshop. And John thought that maybe we could do something like that with Photoshop. And I kind of wanted to do something that we could get the, the photo in the camera in one click without having to do a lot of Photoshop. Um, and so I came up with the idea of photographing on uh, of her in water and then causing ripples in the water so that they would move through the through the frame and cause the top of her head to sort of disintegrate and uh, we can see here what we ended up doing is uh, simply putting a cast iron skillet on a kitchen counter um, and we covered up the the background we just made the background black and shine one light at at Anna's face and John wiggled his fingers in the water. And after about five or six tries, we got John's finger wiggling just right. And it gave us this beautiful photograph, which really captured what John was trying to uh, deliver with the photo, just doing it in, in a completely different method. Um, we have another shot of this same, this is the kitchen in the house that we, we just rented an Airbnb in Putney, Vermont. And this is Roman just looking at some of the photo concepts in that, that same location. Uh, so we got, we got real creative with how we could turn just various spaces of this house into photo studio setups. You can see in the background, we've got another setup back here. And if you read the book, you'll see this chandelier a couple of times, um, but uh, I, I was really proud with the way this came out, considering the fact that all we were doing was photographing a reflection in a cast iron skillet. Yeah, and I have to tell you, Scott, I was a little worried when you broke out a frying pan and said, let's shoot this. <laughs> John was more than a little bit worried. <laughs> it, when we were going to do this a year previous, uh, we had in my the basement of my house. We had I had a big rig set up with a big pool, and I'd done all the all the tests, and I, I had this very large, elaborate thing set up to do that photograph. And having an extra year to think about it enabled me to simplify it down to all I really need is a cast iron pan. Um, but it, sometimes John goes out on faith more than a lot of people would, but we've known each other for about 40 years. So he knows when to trust me and when to challenge me. And um, this one, fortunately, he, he trusted me. And later on in this presentation, you're going to see those cast iron skillets again. Yeah, we, we got, we, we make some good use out of, uh, out of the skillets. Um, so thinking back to the photograph, and I'm sorry, the, the poem and looking at the photo, um, you probably got a sense that this was a, a you know, a raw thought about um, insanity, and that's exactly what it's about. Um, and there are uh, a few uh, raw thoughts in the book that deal with mental illness and insanity, um, uh, and it, it is it is a very important topic uh, in today's uh, medical. Uh, community and in the community at large. And I wanted to make sure that I covered that 
um, in Meridian. And the next poem, or the next raw thought, uh, is just a few pages further in the book. And, and again, it, it deals with maybe not so much insanity, but um, paranoia, extreme paranoia. Um, and uh, I, I like to say that everyone is at least a little bit insane. <laughs> Um, so I think people can relate to maybe this one a little bit better than the, than the other. Um, but uh, this one is called Red Pill, Blue Pill. And, and yes, that is kind of a cliche, uh, you know, stolen idea from, from the Matrix. But it really does fit the, 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 the concept. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll read it to you. Red Pill, Blue Pill. Just got a call from the NSA. I Googled it. Sure enough, the number on my caller ID was NSA headquarters. I almost had a heart attack. By the time I figured out it was a hoax, the guy had all my personal information and bank account numbers. Now I am even more unsettled than when I was utterly convinced he was Agent Smith and I was somehow in some kind of deep trouble. Everything was a little off, and I could not quite figure it out. And as Smith laid out my dire predicament, I thought about how paranoid I was being, and that maybe I am in the matrix. I should probably call them, the NSA. I am just waiting for him to call me Mr. Anderson. Let them know about this crazy hoax. I blocked the number. Do you think they already know? I hope that does not turn out to be a bad move because they probably do. What if the real NSA needs to call? What if none of this is real? And I apologize. Yeah, all the screensaver too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I suppose I should turn that off, right? Okay. There we go. So you, you might you might have heard this poem and say, well, that doesn't sound a whole lot like a poem. And it's kind of weird, it's disjointed. But again, um, you know, poetry is not uh, all traditional, right? It's not all rhyming with with, uh, you know, it's not all English sonnets. Uh, this is uh, definitely a, a, you know, a free, free verse poem. And the point of it was really to, to talk about um, how paranoia can affect people. And um, the, the huge success of this raw thought was the photo. Um, because as you can see, it came out fantastic. And it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, this is my favorite uh, photo from the book. And we actually put it on the back cover um, of the book. You can see it's kind of small, but it's right there. So with that, I'll let Scott uh, talk about how we did this one. Yeah, thank you. This is uh, this is absolutely my favorite photo out of the book as well. Um, if some photos don't make good cover layouts, um, if this one would have worked better as the front cover, this absolutely would have been the cover shot, I believe. Um, but this, this photograph was um, pretty close to John's original uh, concept. And this is just one click of the shutter. And we ended up um, basically just having Anna move her head back and forth and toss her hair around a little bit. And I flash strobes at her while she was doing it so that we could sort of freeze her face in a couple of different locations. Um, we probably spent a half hour making her dizzy, <laughs> tossing her head around, trying to get it just right so that there was just enough hair flying around, but we could still get the, enough detail in her face. Um, but, uh, and John, John took a couple of behind the scenes shots while, while I was working with her. Um, and you can see, you know, she's just whipping her head back and forth and looking very dizzy and disheveled by the end of it. <laughs> but um, this was a, it, it was a difficult shot to pull off and it was physically challenging for, for Anna. But in the end, it's, it's absolutely one of my favorite photos out of the book. 
Awesome. So from, from red pill, blue pill, uh, we move much further forward in the book. Um, there are reasons why Scott and I chose certain Rothfuss to, uh, to show as part of the program today. But one that we certainly could not, absolutely could not leave out was uh, the Rothfuss called Why. And uh, this, this is not only a poem that I really, really like, um, I think this is one of the better poems in the, in the book. It's a simple poem, um, but it, uh, it has a lot of underlying meaning, meaning, and I think people really relate to it. Um, and I'll let Scott, uh, after I'm done reading the poem, tell you how we put this shot together because it was definitely the most challenging of the entire book. So the, the poem is called Why. Every action has an effect. Every effect, a cause. There is a why for everything. But then, is why the same as cause? Is there a reason wherever there is a cause? Does reason lose its validity when emotions run hot or high? When people are foolish or insane? or stupid, or in love. Who cares? Go ahead. Get all caught up in it. See where that gets you. Better to ask yourself, does it matter? If the answer is no, then stop. Sometimes there is no one. So that's the poem. And Scott, tell us how we put this photo together again yeah, one shot yeah this was absolutely the most challenging photograph in the entire book um the original concept I, I won't go into what the original idea was for how we were going to do this but had we done it the original way it would have been really cool but i think it may this may be even better um for starters um that cup of coffee is actually a prop that John made. Um, how did how did you make that? Was it acrylic? How, how did you make the coffee? Yeah, so that is made that made from epoxy, and I epoxy. actually had to yeah I had to uh, uh, find a, a tutorial on YouTube on how to make a flying cup of liquid, and believe it or not, I found one, and it is a multi-day uh, multi-step process and it's very messy and uh, but I, I was able to uh, to pull it off and it, it looks pretty real so I was, I was pretty proud of myself but I don't ever want to have to do it again because that one prop was about maybe 12 hours of work <laughs> yeah that was uh, it came out really well and it, it looks it looks reasonably convincing um, and the book John also did some he did something with the book to keep the pages open and uh, those items, the, the coffee and the book, are both being suspended by, by fishing line. I'll show you a wider behind the scenes shot in a moment to sh so you can see how all this is put together. And I built a little frame specifically for that wooden chair um, so that we could hold it at that specific angle so we could get the appearance of Anna falling backwards. Um, and I tested it with myself sitting in the chair to make sure that the, that the rig would support me because I figured if it could hold my 230 pounds, um, Anna was going to be safe with, I, she weighs way less than half of what I weigh. So we figured it was going to be safe for her. Um, the, uh, let me see here, the, that, that's me in the <laughs> testing out the rig there. And then remember those cast iron skillets? Uh, we use those as counterweights so that uh, we could suspend the, uh, the coffee cup and the book uh, in the scene. And then you can just see that's the, the simple little rig that, that we set up. And after we photographed Anna and the cup and the book in the air, we very carefully, I think I had John hold the chair very still and I, moved the, I removed the rig out of it. And we took another photograph without the, the support behind the chair so that we could marry the two images in Photoshop so that you wouldn't see this ugly two by four uh, and screw uh, frame that I had to build. 
Um, but that was that that was a, a good I don't know. We, we spent months trying to figure out how to do this and do it effectively. Um, and that's a, that's a wider shot that you can see the whole setup, the uh, window uh, seat over between myself and the chair ended up being used for another photo in the book called spring. And that was a right. There's a shot that John took just a, behind the scenes while we were setting that shot up. So we, not only had to get creative with our props, we also had to get really creative into how, how we could do an entire book's worth of photographs in one rental house in a five-day window. When we had originally uh, scheduled this for April 2020, I think we had five different locations that we were supposed to be working at. Um, we were going to be in a hotel. We were going to be in a theater. We were, you know, we just had all these different places that we were going to be working, but because COVID we were really restricted to just doing it in a single Airbnb house. And we really had to make the most of it. And it, it forced us to get more creative. Um, and it, I think it actually added a lot to the, to the overall body of work. But as I told John, as we were leaving that house, I never want to see this place again. I have extracted every photograph that I can possibly get from the place. Yeah, all of that is true. And, and uh, uh, the, the, it was nice that the, the, it was a, it's a nice property, actually. So we did take some shots outside. And I don't know that it's probably a 20 acre, 30 acre property. And there's a there's actually a pond and it's beautiful there so um, we were able to get some really good shots outdoors as well um, and the next um, shot that we'll show you in the associated poem is, is a raw thought that actually we shot outdoors um, and it's called move and it's again further on in the book and um, so for, for this for this particular uh, raw thought it, it's it's from this from a section of the book where, um, you know, the, the title of it says it all, move. If you want to uh, succeed in life, well, you've got to get out of bed. You've got to, to move. You've got to, to, to uh, work at it. Um, good things don't happen to you. You make good things happen to you. Uh, so with that, move. Could be... It is not all bad, all crisis and regret. Possible, I have not had the worst of worst days yet. Perhaps I am standing still while others move along. It could be a test of will that filters frail from strong. Will I ever start to move? In this, I have a voice. To myself, I need to prove I can commit to choice. Weakness is to take a knee, fear I will not succeed. If I choose a destiny and move, then I am free. And uh, so, Scott, tell us how incredibly difficult this shot was. <laughs> this this um, Roman really made this shot what it is we we didn't want it to look like he was jumping we wanted it to look like he was being drawn upwards and that really required him to be sort of relaxed when he was up at the at the peak of his jump um this was the first and only photo that i needed to take of this um, i did one test shot just to get the exposure right with him standing on the ground and then uh, he jumped one time. And when we saw the photo on the back of the camera, we just turned the camera off and said, yep, we got it. Um, he really just made this shot uh, because he took the time to really understand what we were trying to accomplish. And that's the, that's the mark of a great model. They don't just take direction. They, they really understand what, what it is that you're looking for. And you can just, we, we have this, uh, you know, the ability to really trust Anna and Roman to, to give us what we need. They'll, you saw in a behind the scenes photo earlier, you know, Roman standing at that kitchen counter, pouring over a poem and, and thinking about what needed to be done for it. And um, he just went out, popped once in the air and just everything was just absolutely perfect. Um, I wish they were all that easy. 
Um, <laughs> this, uh, we, we lucked out with the atmosphere. Um, it really was, it was a foggy morning. There was dew on the grass. Um, and so just looking off into the distance, this is looking out across the Connecticut River Valley from Putney, Vermont into New Hampshire. And um, that, that nice little haze in the air just really added so much to this photograph. Um, the day before, there was about a foot of snow on this yard um, and it had all melted. We, we just got so lucky with it. Um, but John, we did get a, a question in the Q&A. Somebody had asked, an anonymous attendee asked, how many pitchers were not used? Um, I believe that every shot that we set out to take is in the book, right? We, did, we, didn't, we didn't edit any, any photos out, correct? We used every one of them? I think you're right. I think we, yeah. we used it. No, there's, there's one that we took the, the snow angel shot. Okay, that's it, right. It, so we, what one one I one idea that we had didn't pan out. Um, but other than that, you know, aside from taking some test photos or, or maybe with a shot like that one with Anna's whipping her hair back and forth, where we might need to do it 15 or 20 times before we get everything right. Um, those shots obviously didn't make it in the book, but. With, with one exception, every photo that we plan to take is in the book. And actually the, the one shot that didn't make it in the book, we weren't planning on doing. We just thought, hey, let's get a photo using my drone of Anna doing a snow angel because we thought it might work for something. And come to find out the original concept was actually better. So uh, I hope that answers the, uh, the question for you. So for those of you that don't know me, I, I used to be a pilot in the Air Force, and Scott has this really awesome drone that he uses for photography, and uh, it's very expensive, and uh, and so you have to bring it. Hold on, here we go. I'm like, you've got to bring the drone, and uh, you know, and because we might find you know a great shot that we can take using the drone, and. Um, and so there was a, a huge snowstorm the day before we started shooting, um, which was amazing because this is the end of April, okay? But in New Hampshire, having grown up there and Scott can attest, um, it's, not, it's not an uncommon thing to, to have a big snowstorm uh, in April or even May for that matter. Um, and so we were like, hey, let's take, a, let's take a shot of Anna from above using the drone, making a snow angel, and it just didn't fit as well as the planned photographs that that we had worked on for a year ago figure and so it got left out yeah it's amazing the spur of the moment didn't trump two years of deliberate planning go figure yeah the truth is i just wanted to see the drone and maybe try to play with it a little bit but scott wouldn't let me so um all right so staying on the topic of snow um, the next shot um, was actually completed well in advance of this photo shoot um, because it required snow. It's, it's a poem, it's a raw thought called Reminiscence. And it, we needed um, falling snow. This was the concept. And so we, I, you know, Scott and I worked out that he would on his own whenever there was because you know he's in new hampshire uh you know when there was a snowstorm in new hampshire he was going to go get this shot done and he did he got a good shot but then we had this snowstorm this incredible snowstorm with huge pieces of snow falling out of the sky i mean it was it was a certified you know category 10 blizzard so we're like hey you might be able to get a better snow shot for reminiscence, and I'll let Scott explain this in a moment, but uh, let me read the poem first. And I will say that when I wrote Reminiscence, um, it was for uh, New Year's, it was for New Year's Eve. Um, so I had written this in, in this late December of, of uh, 20, 2019 right before New Year's Eve. Reminiscence. Slow falls the snow, laughing, glasses clinking, 
cheery conversation, anticipation, new beginnings. But I'm entranced by the window, lost in the silent ballet, countless crystalline miracles dancing gracefully down to a light on white obscurity. And I find myself imploring the wind, keep them aloft just a little longer. Um, so it's about memories from the year that just is about to end, good memories. And uh, I really like that poem. So Scott, tell us about this one. Yeah, well, as John was saying, um, we I did have a photo already shot, and I forgot to put it into this presentation. I'm going to see if I can get it in here right now. Um, I might be able to. Hold on just a sec. That right there. Hold on. Oh, no. Well, let's see if I can find it. I'm not going to be able to find it. Oh, well, um, well, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I can get back to where I need to be here. Hold on a sec. Sorry about this. Oh, wait. There it is. That was it. That was it. I just saw it right there. And I, like this. Okay. That was the, that was the photo that I had originally shot back I think the previous winter, actually, um, just a photo of my backyard. And while it's, it's a beautiful shot of snow on trees, it really didn't capture the snowflakes falling. And the poem really talks about falling snow. So this was one of those times where earlier I said, you know, John knows when to trust me and when to challenge me. And when he saw the big, fat, puffy snowflakes, uh, he stepped up and challenged me. And we were able to get that shot of the uh, of the snow falling on that railing, um, and it it was you know it, it was a very it was just a a great photo that goes really well with the poem. Um, the night before, uh, we had been uh, shooting at my home in New Hampshire, and we were in just a driving rainstorm. Um, this is a, a shot from the book that was just absolutely pouring. I think we got like two inches of rain that night. And then the next morning as we were driving over to the house in Putney, um, this is the road that we had to drive in on. And by the time we hit midday, I think trees had fallen down on the road and there was a foot of snow. It was, it was kind of... <laughs> It was kind of a disaster. We had a, we had a lot going against us uh, that weekend, but it did produce one really nice, serene photo with big puffy snowflakes. So we're grateful for that part anyway. Scott, do you have do you have the cupcakes photo, Andy? Um, I'd have to go hunting for it. No, that's right. I, I, I just wanted to mention. I'm going to I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that you all don't have to watch while I go hunting, and then, so. Why don't you talk about it? I can find it. You go ahead and talk about what you wanted to say about that one. Yeah, so um, so I wanted to bring it up because it was during this snowstorm that we got to the point where we needed to, sh to shoot one of the photos that has Anna. Uh, it, it's there called, it it's a, for, yeah, this is for um, a Ratha called Want. And the, the poem in the raw thought in general is, is about the difference between wanting something and needing something. And what the, the concept had always been this, that, that Anna would have these ridiculously um, decadent cupcakes, not just one, but several, with that look in her eyes like, I'm going to eat you, and then I'm going to eat the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And so we had to find a place that could make this kind of cupcake. And, and you, you can't just go to the grocery store and get these. Um, you have to have them made by a, a cake artist. And so we found one. 
And it was in New Hampshire, and about a half an hour drive from where we were shooting in Putney. And when it came time to do this shot, um, I had to go drive and, and pick them up. Only it had been snowing for like 24 hours straight, and the, the roads were, you know, covered with perhaps you know 12 to 18 inches of snow. Um, and the, the driveway to the house where we were shooting is long and twisty, and a tree had actually fallen across under the weight of the snow across the road. Now, so I'm by myself. So the trek to go get these cupcakes, which last, uh, Scott, was I gone for what, two and a half hours maybe? Yeah, at it, was least? About, it was about that, two and a half hours at least, yeah. Yeah, so it's a story all in itself because I, I literally – in dress shoes and no jacket, you know, because I'm there from Texas, not playing at all to have to dress for a snowstorm, trying to move this really very large tree by myself out of the way so I can get back in the car and drive through the snow across the river into New Hampshire to a different state to get these ridiculously decadent cupcakes and get them back so we could make this shot. So, uh, as you can see, I was able to, and without, uh, you know, driving off the road. Good thing uh, in New Hampshire, unlike other kind of uh, southern states, um, they're very good about clearing the roads even during a snowstorm. So it wasn't too bad once I was able to get out on the highway. Yeah. But and the cupcakes were good. It was worth it. <laughs> we did eat them afterwards, <laughs> or we tried to. We, we ate pieces. No, I ate a whole one. Scott ate a whole one. <laughs> Actually, I, I ate I two whole ones. <laughs> Not one sitting. Not one sitting. No, no, it was two sittings. Even for me, that was, that was a lot. <laughs> it looks like we've got another question in, in the Q&A, John. Hold on a second. Let me, let me pull it up here. Oh, somebody, uh, Armin is asking how we how Armin is asking how we pick the models. Um, we talked about that a little bit earlier in the in the program, but the we had searched for about eight or nine months before we found Anna uh, for the first book, and we actually had to do a weekend worth of shooting before we could find a male model. It took us almost a year and a half to find Roman. Um, there are uh, model, there are websites that help models and photographers find each other. Um, and it was really, you know, finding the right people with the right attitudes um, who kind of had a heart for the project because this is a heck of a lot of work. It's, they, the, the models work their butts off. Um, and you needed to have a passion for the project. And it was, it was difficult to find people that were going to be as committed as Anna and Roman turned out to be. Um, but it, it took a little bit of work. And, and ironically, um, you know, Anna is from the Ukraine and, um, and uh, Roman is from Belarus. And when the first weekend that they worked together, I think was the weekend after Russia had invaded the Ukraine. Um, and so John and I were kind of biting our fingernails, hoping that we weren't going to have World War III break out on set, but uh, they were wonderful together, so. Yeah, they were, and, and uh, at least when we were shooting for Roth Lots, uh, there was an awful lot of Russian being spoken on the set, so Scott and I were at times trying to figure out what was being said. Um, by the time we uh, shot for Meridian, um, they both had gotten quite good at English, um, so so there, I, I didn't really hear much Russian <laughs> on the on the on the set this time. But um, what a wonderful team, top to bottom. You know, as Scott said, we brought the band back for for uh, you know one more go, and it was just as great an experience, as difficult and as long as the shoot was. Um, just as great an experience the second time around as it was the first. And if Scott and I ever do a third book, which we are talking about doing, I'm not going to give away 
much detail. Um, but it is something that's going to be a little more difficult than what we've done so far with raw thoughts and meridian. The underlying philosophy uh, is going to be a little bit different, a little bit uh, more elevated, if you will. The photography is going to be more difficult. Um, and if we do do it, it's not guaranteed, but if we do, it's probably, we're probably looking at a year and a half from now before it comes out minimum, just because that's how long it takes to plan these things really well and pull it all together. Um, so, uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, any questions from the folks here in person? No? All right. Brainstorming process. So there's, the, the, there is a lot of it. Let's put it that way. Um, so when you have a year to, to 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 kind of work through the concepts, the, the photo concepts, because let's be honest, <clears throat> the, the poetry comes first, and then Scott and I work together to come up with a, a photography concept that not only not only bolsters the, the meaning or, or the, the um, how evocative the, the poem is. We want, we want a, a photograph, the goal is to have a photograph that when, when paired with the poem, the sum of the, 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 two, the sum of the two is greater than the other. The addition of the two is greater than the sum of its parts. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they're indelibly linked. And, and so you read the poem, you look at the photo, and you go, whoa, you know, I really feel something from that, or I really understand that, or that really pisses me off, or that makes me think of my own problem in my own life. And it, it's, it's, that's the idea. Um, so, so it takes a long time, and the, the process is, a, there's a lot of back and forth between me and him. Yeah, and what what typically happens is John will John has in the past he sent me the poetry and he'll send I wait till he gets the book pretty much written and he sends me all the poetry and I read through it and I'm taking notes and coming up with ideas for what I think might work for photos and John at this point has not sent me any of his photo ideas he just sent me the poetry so my first read I'm writing down notes in the column of each one what I'm what I'm thinking in that moment in, as my first impression. And a lot of the times then when John shows me what he was thinking of for photos for the book, a lot of the time those two ideas are very similar because for whatever reason, the poem evoked the same image in both of us. Now, you know, John and I, we grew up together and we took very different paths in our lives. You know, while John was off succeeding in the military, I was riding around the country in a VW bus following the Grateful Dead. But even sometimes, though, even though you start in the same place and you take wildly different paths, you can come around and still end up in the same destination. And sometimes the photos end up being like that, where John will have one idea that's way out in left field and my idea is way out in right field. And in the end, we settle on something that's in center field. And then other times we end up in left field. Um, there, are, there are a few times where ideas that I, that I had just after talking it over with John and, and really getting a better insight on, on, the, on the poem, I realized, yeah, my idea really wasn't going to properly communicate that. Um, but the interesting thing about poetry, and you know, John, John has also been willing at times to let my vision for the photo go forward, even though it wasn't what he was seeing in the poem. Because the interesting thing about poetry is it is so subjective. 20 people read a poem and they're going to have a different image pop into their heads. And the idea of raw thoughts and Meridian is we're giving you a starting point of an image before you start reading the poem. It's almost, I, I think of the photograph as foreshadowing. You open the page and you see the photograph right away before you get into the poem. And it just offers a little bit of foreshadowing and it might help steer the reader a little bit in one direction 
as far as how they're going to interpret the, the poem. Yeah, and, and it's part of the reason we went with black and white. This was, you know, you know, the idea was that uh, without color, we allowed the reader to put color in, right? Um, Scott's great idea for raw thoughts was that we'll use film, which is grainier and, and has less detail and um, feels more real, right? More raw. But it allows the, it, it, it kind of continues with that. It allows the reader or the viewer to put that detail in based on their own life experiences. Um, and so it worked really well. And with Meridian, mostly uh, digital photography, but um, that was in line with the idea that Meridian would be more refined uh, and more uh, less raw. So with that, I am getting the signal. Oh, oh, it's frozen. We still have a few minutes. And. I think when I changed views, it worked fine. And I go back. Hey, I'm here. All right. Sorry about that. That's okay. I'll just leave it like that for now. Um, can I go back? To Here we go. All right. All right. Well, sorry about that. We got about. It looked like we got. We're about five minutes of. Um, is there? We probably have time for one more question. If somebody has one. Go ahead. Ask a question. No. How related to your other book? How what? How related? Are they completely different? Separated thoughts. Okay. So the question was. Um, Meridian, um, obviously Meridian Raw Thoughts are, are they're, they're part of a series, right? This is the Raw Thoughts series. Um, Raw Thoughts is the first book. Uh, the subtitle is uh, A Mindful Fusion of Poetic and Photographic Art. Um, Meridian, the, the subtitle is A Raw Thoughts Book. Uh, and if we do a third uh, a third book, uh, the subtitle will also be a Raw Thoughts book. But I also do have a couple of other books out there. Um, it's They are two spy thrillers, part of a, a spy thriller trilogy called the Devolution Trilogy. And yes, Scott helped me with the photography for the, uh, for the covers for those books. I don't have the, the photos to show you. Uh, but they are nothing at all uh, like Raw Thoughts or Meridian. They couldn't be more different. They're spy novels. And, uh, and so, yeah, my, my writing style is very eclectic, uh, like the rest of my life. Um, and uh, I like to do different things at different times. And so you can find out... More information about Raw Thoughts, Meridian, uh, the Devolution Trilogy on my website, johnjcasey.com. Um, and you can order the books from there if you like. Uh, Scott also has a website, scotthussey.com. Yep. And uh, if you yep. want to see more about his photography, he doesn't do just uh, fine art. Or, and wedding photography also does commercial photography and, and other types of photography. So you can visit his website as well. And if you're into motorcycle racing, you'll find some good shots there too. Scott has some really, really good photos of uh, the New Hampshire Motor Speedway. Uh, with the, yeah, where they do a lot of motorcycle racing. So. So thank you everyone for joining. Again, thank you Philo Coffee and World First Council of San Antonio for hosting. Uh, it's been great. Thank you.